What? <laughs> now if I co-sign that. <laughs> I was watching a TikTok yesterday. About slaves? No. <laughs> I was watching a TikTok yesterday. It was, it was... The, it, the TikTok gives me a lot of like mental health and inspirational, motivational stuff. You know, sometimes it does that for me, and I'm like, mind your own business. I'm okay. Mind your own business algorithm. <laughs> All right. Um, but the guy ended the video by saying, if no one said it to you today, I love you. And it like, <laughs> it, like that's not healthy. Me. It was not good for me to hear that. I didn't like it. That's not healthy. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> yeah, like. What can I do with that love? Can I borrow money on that love? It's a very, you know? a very high pressure love. <laughs> yeah, and also it, it just, it, I don't know, kind of feels like government cheese. <laughs> Who moved my yeah. government love? Yeah, government issued love. I don't even want to say that out loud <laughs> before it becomes a, <laughs> a, a part of a presidential platform. The love but lines are too long. Presidential. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 on that sweet note, I'll note like the thing that I like about the Happy Gilmore universe of movies and all their misfits is the moral is always everybody, even the weirdest person's worthy of love. Yeah. Mm. No, that is that is very much baked into that that kind of movie. Uh, okay. Which I think is also partly why it's they're you know they're really really popular with kids. Yeah. Kids love Adam Sandler movies. And like I just even his new watched, stuff. Yeah. Oh no, like grown ups. Like like that's apparently you just watched it. My mother in law watched that. Yeah. Loved uh, it. Apparently uh, uh grown ups did so well it got like David Spade a five picture deal with Netflix. Wow. Ooh. Because like the algorithm's like, we love Adam Sandler. You're, you're attached to him. You're, 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 you're close good to enough. Him. Like we can just <laughs> slot in a you movie where you're the computer man who gets into a um, heist with a supermodel like that's fine that's so funny yeah. they're not enough david spade movies uh this might be my pick but but he has uh, the a, a new podcast with dana carvey that is interesting hmm. interesting interesting all right. Hello, everybody. I'm assuming we're live. Hopefully. There we go. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Are we live? I'm, I'm told so. Are yeah. we live? No dropped frames. By the way, thank you, everybody, for joining us yesterday for Back to the Movies. Um, I believe I was able to get a clean recording on that, so we might actually be able to put that uh, that commentary up on Patreon somewhere. Oh, that'd be great. So, uh, oh, what'd you do? We, we watched Back to the Future uh, on the a stream. A movie that uh, Bryce uh, not only has never seen, but was delightfully unspoiled on. Like, like, oh, wonderful. There, like, there giant, was a lot I was giant surprised. Giant chunks. Yeah. It was, it was really great. One of the most misunderstood films in screenwriting where you hear people say, oh, Marty has no character arc. I'm like, it's a very clear arc if you know what you're looking for. It's just not a romantic art arc. No, no. You well, know. with his mom, no. But, well, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Um, but that was fun. So, every, thank you for joining movie. us. I, it was so fun. I think we should do it for for more of. Well, also, like that was, but, but Bob Gale worked on that one for like it was like seven years or something. Like he had he had spent a ton of time on the on the screenplay for Back oh, to the wow. Future. So uh, I had a moment ruined for me in the opening credit sequence because uh, on Harmontown, uh, Jeff B. Davis. Thought the funniest thing in the world because it's a Robert, Robert Zemeckis movie. Yeah, was that one? It's one. It, once it was over, somebody in the audience says, "Spielberg's done it again." Yeah, and yeah. he he's told that story over and over and over again. Guess who the executive producer? Oh of yeah, the movie Spielberg. Is, yeah, right? <laughs> Spielberg had his finger, handprints over all over it. it yeah, was, yeah, it yeah. yeah. Steven Spielberg presents a very different movie without Spielberg. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, very much Zemeckis. But if you look at some of the the most some of the most endearing Zemeckis stuff is Spielberg producing. Oh and, yeah. Also, and, Kathleen Kennedy is on on that call sheet. Oh yeah, she was yeah. Uh, an exec on that. Yeah, on on, on the same title card as uh, as Spielberg. Yeah, that's right. All right, uh, you guys ready to do some weird things? Mm-hmm. Let's uh, do it, baby. Andrew, I'll count you in. In three, <clears throat> two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. 
Brian Brushwood. Happy James Webb Space Telescope arrives at Lagrange Point today. A final destination. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Oh, I don't observe that. I observe it <laughs> on Monday, on yeah. Fridays. I observe it on the Friday before the Monday. <laughs> yeah, I actually. Yeah, it's the Canadian version of the holiday. <laughs> see, see, yeah. So as uh, Brian said, James Webb Space Telescope has finally reached its orbital position where it's going to be unlocking the mysteries of the universe you know show us where asgard is you know uh the titan that thanos is from um and a bunch of other really cool things i'm looking for in science um when are we gonna get these it's, these snaps when's it gonna start snapping oh it's it's gonna be months it's gonna be months and it, and they have to calibrate it uh, especially yeah. because uh, the social team uh, at NASA has gotten so good at their game. Uh, the, uh, I, I guarantee you that they're smart enough to um, whatever they release will will look sufficiently dazzling or be placed into a sufficiently important context where they're able to compare it to Hubble be like this, <laughs> James Webb yeah, be like this. That's fine. I, I when? you a telescope. Show me the this. pictures, you weird I, telescope. My telescope looks I, like this, so her telescope looks like this. I don't know that because of the number of industry and other governmental partners involved in that. I have a feeling the first photo when we say, hey, here's the really blurry photo. They're probably debating that that's the calibration thing just because it's like – this is this is like there's like all the different agencies and organizations with it. I think if one person could kind of control it, you know, they could be like, no, you know, we yeah, we've got to blow, we've got to blow them away. But like there are all these other, you know, well, we need to look and, at the calibration data. And, and if if that is the case, I think they've gotten, uh, as they say, ahead of the narrative enough that that it's not going to be we're all like, oh, what is this? You need to send up astronauts to fix it. Don't kill Sandra Bullock again. <laughs> I hope you're right. I hope you're right. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I, I wah, wah, look what we paid twenty billion for this. I mean, My I kid could have done this. I mean, they've they've done a pretty fair job of explaining just how many uh, 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 sub elements need to be individually focused and calibrated. But 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 then again, I'm clearly paying attention to it. Uh, I I bet someone out there didn't even know today was. James Webb telescope arrives at Lagrange Point too. Yeah, I know Here. some idiot, <laughs> some big dumb idiot didn't know that. <laughs> We're all laughing for the same reason. <laughs> uh, they're just off screen. Oh man, uh, idiots, all of them, uh, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. People who definitely knew that. Same people. We're all this. We're all in the same club. <laughs> Screw the people outside of it. Am I right? <laughs> Uh, from the Planetary Society, they had an article by Heidi Hamel, Hamel on uh, back in December, uh, a month ago on December 22nd. Headline, why will it take six months to see James Webb Space Telescope's first science images? So they talked to NASA to explain, like, yeah, it's, you know, funding, baby, funding. <laughs> Boy, I, I really have discovered uh, watching this story how uncomfortable I am with the use of science as just a... A, a generic noun, or or a, or as a a, a, a plur or a, a a proper noun. Where it's this is this like, is this this is the line the well, line for no, you. No, 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 no. I mean, it's like uh uh it hasn't been rubbed in my face recently. Gotcha. We've had you know uh, in this house we believe in science so long as science means ivermectin or science means masks or science you know like yeah. but but but. To hear, to hear NPR and, and, and mainstream outlets of all varieties say, finally, it's going to go out there with a giant ice cream scooper and scoop up all the science. We're finally going to get some of that science that we've been looking for. Yeah. I sent Bryce a graphic. Here we go. This is sort of a timeline of all the <laughs> it's Listen, uh, Brian, I wish we had, you know, Mr. Space Telescope CEO who got to decide what to do, but this is what we're getting. Yeah, so uh, we're seeing we're seeing a very exciting multi-instrument forces adjustments continues. Multi-instruments activity complete. Delgar, so tel like, uh, uh, about, uh, complete. About half a Freaking year. Moving target tracking tests. Uh, of course, about a month later, Miri's spectroscopy 
begin moving target. There's a lot of verified. Assets, but to be honest, very, very the, even these uncalibrated images that are simulated uh, look pretty cool. So I, I rescind my argument, and I actually think they they will release like some raw. Right here, yeah. here's a here's how crazy stuff looks uncalibrated. Uh, so it's super exciting. Uh, the chances, the 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 fear that James Webb Space Telescope would one ever launch, two, make it into orbit or make it out to where it is now. There were so many risk factors involved, and it is uh, hats off to the team and everybody who worked on this. We, you know, we often are very critical of NASA, as you should be of any you know any organization that scale, um, and praise when they do good work. And so far, again, we haven't even just yet images yet but getting it to that point that is no small achievement that is incredible amazing piece of technology and amazing so far i'm excited yeah i i like it i think it's good i like it Thumbs when, up. i like it when uh uh directors other than robert rodriguez are running it <laughs> jesus <laughs> uh i did not particularly notice a difference uh oh. let's yeah, let's not. Hey, guys, <laughs> guys, come on. Hey, guys, look. What are you trying to do? Rule with respect, what are Justin? We, what are we trying to do here? Right? Uh, uh, I thought we were talking about the James Webb Space Telescope. I'm going to tell you, you, you know what's... I, can we just turn this into complaining about things? Complaining about <laughs> art? Well, can we turn it into the art critics corner hour? Because well, I, I'm well, here I for all of it. I'm just trying to be the good sport and move things along. I'm going to take the positive note. Okay. You know, you know, like you ever meet that person that like, uh, even when they fail, they're successful, you know, like, uh, I didn't, uh, you know, I get shows for quarterback, you know, I'm going to be, you know, halfback or this, but then I didn't get away. They, they always, something turns out right. Like sure. even they're just like, they, that, now uh, they own a, a fleet of used car dealerships or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't buy Apple what I should have. I dumped it all into Google, which the peak was different. You're like, wait, what? You know, yeah. you're like, what do you mean? And then you're like, uh, or missed out just on can't... Bitcoin. I had to settle for Ethereum. Uh... Yeah. yeah. Well, right now, um, uh, I got like, I don't. I'm not convinced. I mean, I, I'm kind of convinced we're in a simulation. I mean, I, I kind of <laughs> think the evidence leads to a simulation. That was and just I the right amount of hard left turn. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm I, fully I, engaged. I, I kind of think I know who the winners are in this simulation. Yeah. Okay. Um. So you're Elon Musk. Sure. And you go from, you know, you make a bunch with Zip2, and then you go create X.com and merge with PayPal, and you make your money from there. And then you create, oh, I'm going to create, like, the greatest electric car company there is. Oh, I'm yeah. the richest man in the world. Oh, I'm going to I'm gonna create a space company. Oh, I'm going to date, like, you know, famous Hollywood model, you know, actress models and all that stuff. Oh, I'm going to launch my Falcon rocket and push a satellite into space. Oh, my upper stage is accidentally going to hit the moon? Wait, did that happen? It's going to happen in March. The upper stage that was used to launch the NOAA uh, satellite is going to hit the moon. Apparently, the trajectory was, just to put it right on there, it may be the first accidental thing to ever land on the moon. Oh, that's awesome. Damn. Do you get, like, a fine for that? Like, <laughs> uh, uh, space littering? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, if anything, like, it would be litter while it's still in orbit, like, uh, in fact, he should be given like the Boy Scouts of America should give him a a a a, a, a pitch in litter badge or something. I don't know, man. The, the, the moon science. might be pissed off. What? But there's the a research. Might... Yeah, it was like it's a hit the dark side. They might, but research wise, they'll be able to see what happens to the impact. But I'm like, when your misses hit the moon, and it wasn't even a miss. It was just like, oh yeah, and we. have you know, the upper stage is yeah. going to look Oopsie up. poopsie, we're hitting the moon. <laughs> you know that cliche, aim for the stars. If you miss, you'll at least get to the moon. Yeah. He literally, <laughs> he literally did. <laughs> uh, People uh, are going to get pissed about this, right? This feels like a a, a ready-made <laughs> people are going to get pissed uh, for no I, reason. Wait, people are going to get pissed at people who are cheering for the fact that this happened. Like, uh, this is great because you uh, you can we can now predict down to the day when a set of news stories are going to happen and when minutes later a backlash against 
Because this is too good of a story to not get press. Elon Musk litters on the moon. Or Elon Musk (laughs) runs his rocket into the moon. Also is is going to be... Elon Musk lands on the moon. So so it plays either way. Either as Oh, it's not going to play positively. Uh, Oh, no, no, no. You can write the article either way. Yes. People who share the story. Yes. You could write 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 the article either way. But, like, uh, that is not how I believe the the press will be written. I, I think that this is far more... Or something that will be seized on, considering for whatever reason Elon Musk is the bellwether of the con- the culture war, and for whatever reason people need to take these blood in the mouth takes on on one side or the other. There's no way that this does not land on the screw Elon Musk side. Because I, I don't think anybody is going to on the pro Elon Musk side is going to be like, finally, we'll show the moon who's boss. Oh no, no, no! We I, stand, I, I, Elon. I, I, like, think, I, I think what you're going to get is, uh, uh, wait, does this mean that Elon gets to claim the dark side of the moon for his <laughs> own? Uh, or, or now, I guess there has been probes. There have been probes. Yeah, the yeah, they've done. They've done. We've actually impacted rocket stages against the moon because, like, what happens is we've got we've got the Chandeska orbiter going around the moon, and I think maybe a couple other. And so, what is cool is that if it may offer an opportunity to basically Chandrayaan, sorry, it'll offer us the opportunity to see what debris get kicked up, the the selenology yeah. of the moon. So that's what's exciting. Is that actually there's going to be could be some good science that comes out of it. Yeah. The the. the... Uh, this this will be similar to the L cross mission per uh, uh, the Project Pluto website, um, and so there will actually be some amount of value for this happening. Uh, they say, "quote In essence, this is a free L cross, except we probably won't see the impact because it's on the far side of the moon." Uh, the L cross was uh, exciting because they they were like uh, this thing was going to go down anyway, but they had just enough juice to direct it towards one of the poles, and they were hoping that with a spectro spectroscopy they would be able to figure out you know how much water mm-hmm. was kicked up uh, it, it apparently didn't yield as much and without it we wouldn't have gotten to the m cross i don't know what it's a dumb joke I, it's the sequel to m, l comes cross. m comes after l i know but that was w- the joke w- what's m cross though it doesn't it's exist. the next letter yeah, oh. it's just the next letter. I got it's it. only one joke. Okay. Yeah. It's, not okay. Two jokes. it's a joke about the alphabet. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> no, I thought you um, got, yeah. M-, M cross sounds like like an anime that I was supposed to know. Oh, that, that, like, oh it Brett, does sound like Macross. Actually, you know what? It sounds like Macross, which is an anime. Uh, uh, okay. Oh. Yay. Yeah, it's Macross, which is in West Virginia, and there's M cross, which is a database of bindings and cross links and stuff. So. <laughs> I stand. I just like a gun. I stand. Uh, uh, and Matt correct. Ross. <laughs> Min May. Rick. Min May. I stand more correct. I, yeah. Mm. I stand fully correct. Turns out I am a also, man of letters. Also, Literally. a profile for a guy on Board Game Geeks who is a chemistry professor at Snow College. So there you go. Boom. Boom. It's just so above our head, Brian. We just did. He works at a level that exactly. we just. <laughs> just. <laughs> yeah, I just feel like we saw five, the equivalent fifth, of landing a bit of one of your rockets on the moon accidentally <laughs> yeah. and being able to act like you meant People to. People are going to go back and study that joke. <laughs> it's too good. You want to know what well, else like- is too good? The bargain at patreon.com slash weird things. Uh, 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 true story. Fun fact. Yeah. Uh, we, we went to a sports bar and somebody was like, I love that site. And, yes. And we were like, what are you talking about? And then they pointed at Justin. And then it's like, well, he. Oh, he's got a Patreon hoodie. I've got a Patreon hoodie. Wow. And uh, the lady was like, I give money to uh, a, a podcast that I really, really enjoy uh, on Patreon. And, and we had a, a nice conversation about how much it's a little money uh, uh, that you probably is going to come out in the wash in your monthly expenditures you're never gonna notice probably never gonna think twice about it you're just gonna know that it is it feels good that you are supporting uh uh, independent creators and i'll tell you what uh from this side of being an independent creator it means the world the world to be able to clear your schedule and more than you would otherwise to create this kind of content we show up each and every week friends and we make this thing for you and if you enjoy it on a level that you believe deserves financial uh, support, then you can head on over to patreon.com slash weird things and support us. You get the after things podcast before anybody else. That's where you get the kind of real behind the scenes inside sauce 
about how to be an independent creator. That's where we creator. get real. None of this fake talk about James Webb telescopes landing at Lagrange Point too. No. No. We get real. We real. talk about the hard stuff. We start talking about we we move away from the fiction of the James Webb <laughs> Space Telescope and move, and move to into the real. fact of how you could be an independent creative. Answer exactly. Your you can launch launch your own James Webb Space Telescope. <laughs> yeah. Rise and grind, kings. Yeah. If you go to patreon.com slash weird. Lanch it up. And if you if you know, one thing that doesn't get talked about a lot with Patreon is if you want email notifications, oh. you can get them. Oh. With Patreon, so it's a good way to know that things are coming out. I, I do mean, that. Always. I do that with Andrew Heaton's podcast. That's how I know that it's coming out. Yeah, because yeah, it sends me an email. Patreon.com slash weird things. Gentlemen, we need your help. <gasps> oh, thank goodness! My, my gracious, my good gracious, let's go. Well, there's been an accident on the highway. Good and, lord! A uh, hundred of our prisoners are loose. No, oh, not the prisoners. A hundred of our prisoners. <laughs> I'm going to recuse myself. <laughs> but, but yeah, no, them, them, them prisoners, they're, they're, they're all over the place. And these are madmen. All right. All, apparently the only person who hasn't read this story. So <laughs> I guess it's up to me by myself. Uh, 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 am I a police officer? Who am I? Uh, we'll just cut to the chase. A oh. hundred monkeys got loose. No! Were, medical monkeys got loose. <laughs> medical so monkeys? Now, what, 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 they, they mean they're they were, nurses? Uh, what does they, that mean? Uh, yeah. They were intended to go to a research facility. They're going to go to but school they, to be. But they crashed. Medical. And so and so now, congratulations, uh, Pennsylvania. You have a new invasive species of monkey uh, <laughs> running around crazy. Can I point out the Chiron that we are seeing on screen? Final escape monkey? He captured. Oh, they oh they did get them all. <laughs> all recaptured except one. This is the worst but... version of Pokemon ever. <laughs> no, except for one, which except is obviously one. the protagonist of this Pixar movie. Hopefully, she's pregnant. Do you remember, like, what was it? Outbreak and Dustin Hoffman showing the photo of the monkey and like we need to find this monkey. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just wish it could have been cool. Like if like they're like they just got Dustin Hoffman, an actor who actually played a scientist trying <laughs> to track down a monkey, is here to talk about it. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> he goes into the wrong routine. He's doing Rain Man. <laughs> we we had a uh, uh, an incident in a. Uh, uh, South Florida, I think we mentioned about before, where we had a bunch of oh my god, this the scene of the accident, uh, laboratory, yeah, uh, and also, monkey also, food. Huh? The, the, monkey the food lower the third says final escaped monkey captured subheading all recaptured except one. Does We're, that mean it died? Does that mean pick, what does that pick, mean? Pick pick a lane. <laughs> Do you, how is it final? If you, there's one Did more you, out there, I guess they picked all. Go one. back to the photo the photo of the monkey food on the highway. <laughs> monkey chow. Laboratory Lab diet. animal diet. It's Lab. this big bag, this laboratory, and these biscuits. It's sad. Wow. Well, but I mean, if you're selling to labs, you can't be like uh, happy paw. Like, like you, you probably have to have a. Like, it's gonna the monkeys sell better. see the bag. They see the bag. Put some like colors on it in a coloring book or something. That's not gonna look good in a purchase order. You know, like like you need you need. I need official chat. These are serious people. With I need serious. To- Money bureaucrat bits. Be- yes, it should be called bureau bits. Required yeah, food for you. The standard <laughs> food. Standard unit food time. It's normal. This is why the food. apes took over after they were put in the laboratory <laughs> in Planet of the Apes. <laughs> if they could act, to, they could make these monkeys act. <laughs> then imagine what I could do. <laughs> my favorite line uh yeah man all right so so that they so do we, do we know one one died or or is it still on the loose i don't have that information at we moment. don't have it I, all things being if equal, you are that I'm, monkey I'm, please email the show <laughs> his name was momo <laughs> cnn says all monkeys accounted for Ooh. which doesn't sound like all monkeys caught it sounds like <laughs> some monkeys right. in a box all right all right brian <laughs> Yeah. Justin, yeah, you're the drivers of this truck. Okay, okay, yep. and you take turns playing Hearthstone. Yeah, uh, okay, yep. and uh, I want you to reenact 
one, how this happened, and two, your reaction to it. Okay, happened. all right. Uh, look, uh, you uh, get the I, wheel. I'm only three away from legend. It's my turn. Uh, so we're going to do the, the hot swap here. Don't worry about these icy roads. We're pretty much going straight. Okay. On three. Ready? One, one two, two, three. three. Switch. Go. Switch places. Uh, uh, oh, oh, all right. All right. Yeah. All right. Here we go. I got I got my hand on the wheel. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Welcome to Hearthstone. <laughs> yep. Hey, I'm going to close my eyes. <laughs> oh, okay. ah! <laughs> Wait. Oh, well, luckily we're safe. Yep. Um, it's cold out. Should we get out of the car or just sort of play Hearthstone? I think we should play Hearthstone. <laughs> okay. Some time passes. <laughs> well, it looks like I'm not going to hit Legend today. Mm. Let's keep driving. No, we're going to keep. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, but sure. To you, uh, 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 but let's let's try to drive a little bit. Hey, wait, we're driving. Feels a little light in the back. I'm gonna pull over and and, and, just, and check, check things check out. The boot. Make sure yeah. that. Uh, uh, Whoa, okay. Nelly! Boy, did we bite off a big chunk this time, Brushwood. Oh, we wait, screwed up was, big time. This was our last job. He said to us specifically, there's only one rule, kids. Don't crash the truck in such a way that a mon bunch of monkeys get out. Smash cut to the boss's office. That's it. Give me your badge and Hearthstone <laughs> phone. <laughs> The whole phone. So there's a tweet from the troopers, uh, the, from the cops that say all monkeys have been accounted for. Apparently there had been one that was mm, unaccounted for that is apparently accounted for. Yeah. They found and that the, frozen corpse. Yeah. You the lack know, of details. You want to know who accounted for him? Grim Reaper. And upstairs. Oh, okay. The other guy. <laughs> I was thinking the guy downstairs. Oh, jeez. Uh, apparently somebody has a... I had a poor, poor concept I of mean, the lives of monkeys. Uh, in Bryce's defense, were they baptized? I don't think so. <laughs> Have I, they had I, their I, communion? You don't know what, what was going on in that the lab. The communion was lab diet. And you, <laughs> and you, <laughs> I'm not thinking of formula communion wafers. And they come in like a like a Pez dispenser. Yeah. <laughs> one 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 uh, uh, communion appropriate disc. <laughs> Sorry, Andrew, we were, oh. you were doing a podcast. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. I I I if I bring up the topic of a hundred monkeys escape from a lab truck, what can I expect? I mean, aside from a metaphor of what you have to deal with every Monday. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, I. Uh, <clears throat> I live for stories like that. I mean, I don't like to live to see that they're recaptured, but that was the thing we had by, and uh, I think we mentioned this before, where Justin and I grew up, there was a bunch of wild monkeys out by the airport, and they mm -hmm. were kind of mythical, but people knew they were there. And it turned out that they were like escaped from like a herpes research project or something. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. Oh, cool. I've been living with that. <laughs> uh, now explain to me like you know a uh, lab leak is a ridiculous theory <laughs> you know we yeah. you know we've been living next to herpes infected monkeys for decades uh speaking of which i i, I guess i saw a snippet of a news story of them calling all of the hamsters in hong kong because one, one of them had uh covid and I think we had heard about that a while ago too the like, hong kong hamsters the hong kong hamsters <laughs> That sounds like a rollerball team. Oh my! I I, I am team. I am very, I am very put off by the casual use of the word "call." <laughs> Hong Kong's hamster call shows the absurdity oh. of its zero COVID mission, says Quartz. Oh. Now, uh, what is a call? Are they killing these poor hamsters? Well, yes, yes, that is what a call. No, is. they're like, putting them by, up in by hotels the and letting but them, then, you know, ride why out. Why don't the we pandemic. use that? Not call. What the call? That's a bad word for killing hamsters. It should say we're killing, by, by we're the killing thousands. hamsters. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, from a the, large the hamsters are context. accounted for. All of the hamsters. Yeah, have been they're accounted all accounted for. for. Oh my God! So wait, so uh, they found a hamster that had COVID, and they're like, all the hamsters need to die. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. And anybody who accidentally bought a hamster during this time period needs to return their their hamster because it needs to die. That's right. 
Yes. Uh, apparently, the, the so right now the are they at I zero believe, hamsters? Uh, uh, I believe unless they, contraband hamsters, well, illegal well, hamsters. They, they 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 found one from you know a crop of hamsters, and they're all like uh, all of them need to go roll out. Yeah. Uh, apparently, apparently, in the Netherlands, they did a similar thing with minks. They just slaughtered. Because of COVID, of thousands of mink. No, 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 no. This oh, is just a for another thing. Mink. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was what I was thinking of. Yeah. Uh, this uh, the BBC is reporting that uh, there are about two thousand little friends, um, hamsters, and other small mammals uh, that are set to be culled, but there is a petition against it. Um, so, but it's China's. Are they in a waiting room? Like, are they being put up at a hotel, like a sequestered jury? I, I'm assuming. I don't know, Andrew. Do you know? I'm assuming that it's just like. They just announced it, so they have a little bit of time before. I presume that's the case where it's just been announced that, like, congratulations, everybody. Hey, everybody who got themselves a small little pet to keep them, you know, some comfort throughout this pandemic, we're going to have to take it from and murder it. Yeah. <laughs> It's uh, China. You're sorry, used to that. Though, we've so. got reports that there is joy being experienced in the world. <laughs> We're going to need that. I'm sorry. Ah, but I had read that that uh, animal human to animal transmission is part of one of the reasons why they think COVID will be a thing for a forever, very long forever time. Forever and ever. Yeah. Right. Uh, the uh, uh, so so this does uh, I, I think it's fair to say that that we've been vaguely skeptical of China's claims that they've been COVID free uh, for a while. Um, but but says you, American pig dog. Rid, riddle me this: What is the benefit of staying totally COVID free? Because Australia managed for a while, and then the right flavor leaked in, and now they're just as purple as the rest of us. Um, and 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 on the other side of this, they'll have hmm. some immunity. Like is is I can is speak. That, I, I, I can why? I can I can speak to this. Uh, the benefit of a zero COVID strategy is that you would not get COVID for a while. Right. But you would eventually. I was but done might... speaking. Oh. <laughs> oh, no. I, oh, okay. I will... Yeah, that was it. That was the end of I'll... the benefits is you don't get I'll... COVID for a while. For a while. I'll... And I'm going to leave. Defend... <laughs> I'll defend a zero COVID strategy. Okay. Yes. Even though I'm against lockdowns and mandates. Very, make it very, very clear. If you if you try that, if you're a place like an island nation, let's say like Australia or New Zealand or someplace like this, or you can control your borders, you can control your territory, you control what goes in there, and people will blindly give up their rights, whatever, and you have the ability to do this. And, and by, by the way, let me also point out with Australia, they can not only control their outside borders, but they can control their state, what would be their state borders, their, their I, territory I, borders. One of the most chilling things I got is I have somebody in Australia who also is like an Andrew Maine, and sometimes I get his Gmail, and I got his travel permit. And I'm like, what is this? And it was to go from one province to the next. I'm yeah. like, last I checked, you were one country. No. Um, yeah, they can, they, they, uh, they, can, yeah. They, they, they can enforce those borders, and, and uh, cops will drive you back across the border if you do not have the right paperwork. So, so the advantage of a complete lockdown or trying to do this is – if you wait out to the idea now, if you waited to the point that there was a vaccination, you could vaccinate a higher percentage of your population. You might have less overall mortality. Yeah. Remember, we lost the early stages of the pandemic when our, our wise advisors were telling us, don't worry, you don't need masks. Of course, it's not airborne. And it was airborne. And we were told not to wear masks. And the most vulnerable people were not protected by masks because we told them not to wear masks. We ripped through you know, tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people got infected and died because of that. Yeah. Were you a complete lockdown? Well, you would have had the benefit of not having to deal with the idiotic recommendations of not wearing a mask. You'd then know, okay, we should maybe wearing a mask was a good idea. You lock down long enough to the point there's a vaccine. You could then inoculate your most vulnerable, and then your overall death rate from COVID would likely be lower. Yes, which, okay. which, which so. it is. It is in Australia. Yep. Like, like there is there is no doubt that their that their death count. I mean, I think it's. It's like a fraction of. I think a, Bryce a was daily. saying three three thousand compared to nine hundred thousand yes. in the U.S. No, it is yeah. it is it is uh, a, a, an extraordinarily different uh, scenario. Although I will I, I will again reiterate that there are realities for Australia being a something where they can lock down uh, again out, externally and internally, uh, and, and and they have about I think it's like less than the population of California. And think about this too: is that we had, we had one when the suggestion was, "Hey, we should shut down our borders or even prevent travel from high traffic, you know, high states with high this." 
that was met with huge resistance. Yes. Huge, huge, huge resistance that no, we can't do that. The suggestion that people who are illegally crossing the border should be tested and sent back had been thrown out as being inhumane or whatever. And then when we had large protests that were anti-government, but were from like BLM movement, things like this, those were considered, no, that's acceptable, that's appropriate. I, I, I have no problem with protesting. I have no problem with that personally. It is, and it's a person's choice, but it was transmitted, but we didn't want to talk about that. And that's the thing. And so our will, it wasn't just people would say, okay, then if we wanted to be locked down, then you have to give up these other things too, which the people who would sort of maybe say they were pro lockdown were like, well, no, not those. Like, then what's the point of a lockdown? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that there are, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 we can just get into a kind of, uh, a, I mean, larger, it's, 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 a larger, a larger a conversation about, uh, uh, COVID mitigation strategies. Do we want to, do we want to walk down that road or? I mean, sure. yeah, espe okay. especially, uh, I, I think I'm more comfortable with the conversation now that, uh, uh, reports every single day seem to be indicating that, uh, 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 uh you know, more and more cities are seeming to be past their peak and, uh, you know, who knows about strains, but it does look like we're entering, uh, another miniature spring period. Yeah. I mean, you know, and who knows, who knows what happens from here? Uh, I think there are a few things that we know. Number one, this is going to be an endemic virus. Number two, it's seasonal. Uh, number three of uh, vaccines should be looked at as a very effective pre therapeutic. Um, if you, that it will, it'll protect you if you get, uh, uh the disease and, uh, uh, as far as that goes, I mean, if we understand that it is, especially to Omicron, less uh, effective uh, for stopping you getting the virus or transmitting the virus, then, you know, uh, uh, I think that we have kind of a full deck of information. Uh, uh, now, if we're going to reverse engineer that uh, as to what we could have done, should have done, uh, you know, in, in the past and let that inform how we go forward, I think like everything there's there's a glove for every hand we're in a very very big country that has very very different cultural norms i think that there are some basic through lines that uh, americans are different than say europeans or australians but uh in general i think the the biggest thing that we could learn going back is if you don't want to engender fatigue with mitigation strategies, if you believe that the mitigation strategies are as important as we say they are, then you need to create an understanding where these things come and go and, and the restrictions have to go as fast as they come. You have to have the courage to remove them when the worst threats are away, because if you don't, then you engender anger and resentment toward the mitigation strategies, which I think, uh, at times when you have huge onset is damaging. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's damaging to, to everybody to not have that tool in your toolbox, no matter how effective you might think of it. Yeah. Uh, I'm, in fact, uh, wasn't it Starbucks that was one of the first major corporations to uh, uh, roll back the vaccine mandate for uh, employees uh, based on the Supreme Court ruling? Yeah, I mean, we can look at that, uh, you know, that yeah. that element, uh, the, the political element of it. But uh, yeah, I'm science. You know, science is our attempt to try to understand the unknown. And we never have certainty. You know, we call, you know, theory of relativity still a theory, even though it's unlikely we ever see that over being overturned. And every experiment does this. But it is an explanation that fits the available data for something. When science and people of science try to speak with confidence and say things absolutely or definitively or whatever, they set themselves up and, and make, they make things worse for two reasons. Uh, one is that that goes from science to dogma, which is not the role of science to be dogmatic. Two is that if you, if you say people are, for, oh, I don't want to sound like I'm not sure, we got to be, if you speak with conviction and you are wrong, there's a segment of the society that will not trust you and you cannot regain that trust. You look at the media and you look over the last several weeks and you see there's a lot of people in the media like, how do we how do we control media so the dumbs out there don't get any more bad ideas? And it's like the reason they get a lot of bad ideas 
is because they know they're being lied to and then nobody admits to it when they're lied to or people say things they're sure about that they're not. And you can't say, well, we need to filter it even more. We need to filter it. No, that only makes it worse. And that's what we're seeing right now is a segment of the population or segments that don't trust different authorities, sometimes for good reason and sometimes too, because they're actively know that they're they're trying to have information withheld or things shut down. When you see things where people, oh, we should shut down Joe Rogan because he had this guy in there that said things that were wrong. Well, that makes people who adhere to those ideas cling to them even more. It's basic psychology. And that's the most scary thing to me is like, well, this person said this. Well, we need to go shut them down. Like, do you think that's going to stop the people that believe extreme things that they're going to all of a sudden go, well, they shut them down. OK, I guess I'm going to go back to the mainstream. And also, you need people saying things are outside the mainstream because sometimes they're right. Right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I mean, it's it's um, the one thing I will say in terms of the stats that I have watched throughout this entire process uh, were death stats relative to population. And for a while, pre-Delta, you saw states that were clustered in the Northeast that had a higher death per capita. Uh, New York had been at the highest, but you also saw in the top five, New Jersey and Connecticut, uh, a lot of uh, uh, states that, that really were like blistered by that first wave. Now, I believe if you look, at least the last time I looked, the deaths per capita are exactly in line with population. And that includes California, about as blue as blue gets, Florida, now fairly solidly a red state, Texas, very much a, a red state, even more than Florida, and New York, a very, very blue state. Those are our top four states by population. Deaths per capita uh, are now exactly in line, regardless of what state's mitigation strategies that were put in. And I think we can all agree that there was a gulf of difference between the mitigation strategies of California and New York and those of Florida and Texas. To me, that says this is a seasonal disease. To me, that says that, that there are, are some real questions that we should put into exactly what our mitigation strategies are, and uh, uh, we should understand it and be empathetic. I mean, like I, I think that it's really the saddest part about all of this for people that I think are, are genuinely curious about understanding the state of this, this insane, heinous virus is that we tend to go on this uh, uh, carousel in certain elements of our discourse where it's, ha ha, the reds are dying, ha ha, the blues are dying. Uh, and that's, to me, very gross. Uh, uh, it, is, it is the wrong lesson. And it doesn't get us any closer to being to saving lives, which is, I think, ultimately what any person would really truly want. And I, that, I think you're talking about the most important lives, which, of course, are hamsters. And <laughs> that's the real tragedy is these hamsters are getting cold. Yeah, I, I would say back to this point, though, is like that was the thing that's most distressing and was watching either group on there when like, oh, somebody got somebody got the vaccine and they got sick. Ha ha. Or, you know, somebody had it and they died anyways. Ha. And that's like or somebody didn't get vaccinated. Ha ha. They got what they deserve. Like what a horrible if you find yourself rooting for the death of a human that like is not Hitler. You need you and you being and, and based on that based some, on science, the vast majority of population is not Hitler. That is something that, that we have we are fairly certain. Now it's it's like relativity; it's still a theory, but the not Hitler theory is fairly strong and evidence based. That's when you see it, and I see things on Twitter. See people say this, and it's like that's your true colors. Like it, you can you can talk about wanting to be a kind or loving person, but the moment. It, and you don't know, like, like I have some friends that are still not vaccinated. I've, you know, I'm explaining, like, hey, I think, you know, bandages to it, whatever, but I'm not going to belittle them for their choices or whatever, because it's not like we've had a lot of openness about information and stuff. And it's not like our government's encouraged a lot of trust with us and stuff. And I think for people who are a little more paranoid than I, I get it. And, and for somebody to root for the death of somebody like that who's making this choice because of whatever their reason they have, it's... That's you want to know where how you get concentration camp guards. That's how you get it. That's where it comes from. This group, they're worthy of death because they don't agree with the way I feel and because they are this existential threat. That's where that comes from. That's where you're like, oh, well, you know, maybe they deserve to die. 
And people go, how does this happen? And it happens from people who think that, oh, I would never be that person. I would never be the person that would run the gas chamber or whatever. Well, when you de when somebody has a different point of view from you and you dehumanize them to the point that you think that it's okay that they're dead, whether it be somebody who maybe you don't agree with vaccination, maybe they're somebody who is from a disadvantaged group. You know, maybe they're somebody who's, you know, uh, in, a, you know, we, we make jokes about dead prostitutes. You know, we look at people trying to cross our border to freedom who die along the way. And it's like, oh, well, sucks for them. It's like, that's a family. That's a person. That was a living being that wanted yeah. something better. And when we... That's where evil comes from. Is is that that chortling, that that getting some sort of glee out of the death of somebody that you disagree with, or they transgress something, not because they tried to kill you, but because they're just different than you. So, I'll get off my soapbox now. But it's a yeah. digital soapbox, though, that we're gonna sell yeah, as an NFT. If you wish for the death of somebody, or you're glad about it, check yourself. It's a That's bad, it. yeah. Take take a breath. Doug, take take yep. take five. Have a drink of water. Get eight hours yeah. of sleep. <laughs> get thirty minutes of cardio because you need to. You need to clear your mind, my man. What is this? The I, opening I got... to train spotting? Hey, this is the <laughs> opening to. This is the opening to train spotting. <laughs> Choose life. Choose life. <laughs> I'm just thinking planes, trains, and automobiles. I'll like, <laughs> remember that. Great Thanksgiving movie, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Yeah, look, uh, 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 there's, there's, you know, I mean, this gets into the the conversation about like whether or not we are actually more crude in our discourse, or whether or not we are fascinated by the bottom of the bucket where all the, s the scum gathers, and that's like what we look at as as a more representative element of our of our society than it might be. So who knows. I got some kind of interesting, maybe could be uplifting news, hopefully. All right. And What's that? There's a, there's been a dream in space trap, spacecraft and space travel, and that is the idea of the single stage to orbit, the idea of one craft that goes all the way to orbit. SpaceX has said, hey, listen, uh, avionics, aerospace technology is advanced enough. We can do our approach where we have a booster stage that comes back down and lands, and the upper stage does its business, and it eventually could land or whatever. You know, Elon Musk says it's you know it's it's inefficient to try to build like a whole system because you're taking things into orbit and a lot of weight you don't need to, et cetera. But yet that idea still is you know held onto by people who think there's a value. We had an initiative in the 1990s to build the the SST single stage. It was a going to be a craft that could launch from like an airport like an airport runway and make it into space and go back. We ran into problems because part of the spec was they had to build a carbon fiber tank to hold, hold the liquid hydrogen for it. And we just technologically did not have the capability. And the, and the engineers working on it said, if we could have switched to aluminum, which would have worked, it would have worked, but the funding was for carbon fiber tech. And so that whole project got you know got um, disbanded. There's a company called Radian, Washington-based aerospace company. And by the way, Washington's got, you know, it's like Boeing and et cetera. So it's pretty yeah. big. And that's also where... Uh, uh, Blue Origin started from. They're working on their plan for a single stage to orbit plane that could carry people and cargo. Uh, the current design can take up to five people and 5,000 pounds of cargo, and they would be able to bring 10,000 pounds back down to Earth. And again, this is a completely single stage system and would use, you know, basically, you know, engines that would be able to work at, um, go take it up to a certain altitude and then kick in and go to, you know, faster. The challenge is, is you you know, an airplane, you know, a top speed of let's say an SR-71 is like maybe you know three thousand miles per hour to get into orbit. You got to go about twenty thousand miles per hour. So they they would need to be doing things that nobody has ever done with an airplane. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Uh, they need what, one of these renderings appears to depict um, the the uh, space plane being on a track w uh, where it looks like maybe the rockets that are being fired are on the track themselves. So they never even leave the ground. They just get this thing up to such a speed that it's able to um, use aerodynamics to start going up. And I, I, obviously there has to be some amount of fuel to get it all the way up to orbit. And, would, and then it would like the space shuttle glide down. This doesn't stri strike me as super crazy. I mean, clearly, I mean, smart people are working on it and and they think that, you know, there's, you know, some advantage to being able to do this. And so I think that what you're looking at there might be a, uh, 
you know, might be yeah, one approach, which like using like a track acceleration system to do that. The dream, of course, would be something that could use airport runways, use existing airport runways, mm -hmm. go into space, come back down, et cetera. And that may be a dream forever. And, you know, the SpaceX approach is if you can land, only only put in a space what you need to put in a space, land everything else, use two stages, and that makes it more efficient. Also, from a fuel point of view, is the idea that it may take way more fuel to put that into orbit, and that becomes SpaceX is sort of saying, we think the biggest cost is going to be fuel, but other people might say it might be operational cost. Um, the argument that's being made by uh, uh, Peter Beck, which is their Rocket Lab, while they just announced, by the way, Rocket Lab announced their whole new, I think we maybe we showed that, their new approach where they're building their whole like single stage to, or, or not single stage, or bold, they're building a rocket that's going to be the Neutron, which is going to be their kind of competitor, the Falcon 9, which is kind of crazy. It's this big fat sort of rocket where basically it it you know it, it the 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 lower stage has the fairy oh also look at the donk the on that one yep what a what, what a little chub <laughs> we and got so a the, certified chode over here <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is you know how spacex has that upper stage and has the fairy and the idea is the fairy is attached to the lower stage the lower stage opens up and this upper stage then takes off from there and so their idea is that they could recover the fairy they don't want to have to use uh, Peter Beck is the president of, of Rocket Lab has said we don't want to have to have like ships out at sea trying to capture things. He says doing those nautical operations like SpaceX does is really expensive. And so a lot of it's not just it's not really the fuel. And that's exactly what you saw in Moonraker, where they were swiping up satellites or a sandworm. So for, for all for all I know, this is already an existing business plan, but I, I could almost imagine a rocket sled getting something aerodynamic up to speed to hurl it up to, say, I don't know, 35,000 feet, at which point it docks with a space plane that is already there and and it fires up and then kind of toss almost like a picture 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 people throwing fish at a fish market or whatever where it's like you got the the thing on the ground that stays on the ground and it just hurls it up to the next thing that catches it and then it builds up momentum well, and hurls it up even more well you're you're the thing the, the challenge is is the where the thing that is the that it, the second thing that hits is like there's going to be a transfer of momentum which means transfer of energy and so that thing has to then hit it. it if, if it's trying to transfer, it has to hit it at that velocity, which would be kind of a hell of impact. There's bolos, you know, which are the idea of having like the long tethers that come through and you sort of get hold of the, t which we've talked about before. Right. But, um, you know, you've, and you can't have anything really into orbit until you're like 20, you know, until you're, you know, 300 miles up, 200 miles up, I think lowest to orbit you can kind of maintain without a lot of atmospheric drag. And so to do that, you got to be going about 18,000 miles an hour. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess what I'm, uh, the, the idea that, that is novel to my mind that I'm toying with is the idea of, of rather than a single object that sheds pieces of itself, like we see with traditional rocketry, mm -hmm. instead having kind of, you know, three animals at three different levels, uh, each of which can get independently fueled and continue to uh, stay at that level. And essentially the payload is just kind of just chunked from person to so, person, a person like a bucket brigade. So like to, to, to the first thing that would like kind of pass momentum onto it, you'd want to have it be, if it were just like an aircraft going really fast and take out of fuel. But if you're saying that like, okay, it's in low earth orbit, really low earth orbit, and it could do, because you can have a rocket can go up, like you can, you can have a rocket go up a thousand miles. You can, you can have a rocket go up 30 miles an hour if you can have fuel and it can go higher than the space station, but it's going to fall back to earth because it's going to have escape velocity, right? Um, bolos were the idea of you have something get high enough and it catches like a tether and it swings it around and there's enough momentum going around that this thing's not going to get pulled. This thing only gets pulled, you know, maybe accelerates its orbit into Earth. So there is like, if you look up like bolos and tethers, that's sort of that idea of of how to do that. So it's not as crazy as it may seem to some people listening out there if you look up like space tethers and space bolos, because that's basically the idea is like how to get things to further out and you could theoretically put them at different points, Lagrange points, things like this, and just slingshot stuff around. Chuck them. Yeah.
Yurt. We're going to yurt into space, which we talked about before with Spin Lab. That'd be yeet, right? Yeah, uh, yeet. Hey, Sorry. Yeet. You're putting your yeeting a yurt into space. Yeah, you, you could yeet a yurt. Yeah. Uh, I got a pick. Pick it up. Pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. Uh, it's from a relatively small YouTube channel, only 77,000 subscribers, but uh, this is a high quality 90 uh, or 50 minutes that you could spend. Um, uh, it's titled Why Coco, parentheses, probably, parentheses, couldn't talk, parentheses, sorry, <laughs> the deep dive. And it's uh, 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 a pretty good long look uh, into um, the theories of why people wanted to communicate and talk to various animals and um, the various attempts that came with it. And uh, part of the reason that Coco was such a success was because they very carefully hand-selected what videos there are of Coco. <laughs> and uh, uh, it makes a very compelling case that Coco the gorilla was um, uh, uh, basically a, a, a nonsense engine. And yeah. uh, uh, it's... a. Uh, 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 it's just such a, a delightful media darling, just so story that it's really taken root in in the uh, uh, the global gestalt. But uh, man, they got graphs and numbers and all this stuff. Um, it's a uh, uh, it it basically says what uh, <laughs> what I learned in college all those years ago that nobody was uh, wanting to say, uh, and I liked it a lot. So I got a story about. Go ahead. Go ahead. That. You have a Coco story. I, I do. Go. Uh, about Randy, James Randy, mm -hmm. okay, who I worked for. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, I don't want to name names. One of the first conferences, like there was one of the, the, the another primate that had been taught, that one of the, pri the, the primate had been taught, and the woman who was the, known for this or having taught this primate how to do sign language showed a video, was at a preference conference, and Randy was at the conference. Randy stood up and pointed out and said, listen, look at the video. You're signing. You're, it was clever Hans is you're signing, you're showing it what to do and it's mimicking you. Right. And the people there were, didn't quite know what to think. But then I know people in the, like the animal communications industry have said that for years that that set things back. They were angry at Randy, upset with Randy because the statement of that pointing that out saying it was clever Hans and whatnot. And it prevent, put, put a bunch of skepticism on there. And so when Coco came out and all that, there was still always this, well, how much of it is it really signing? And and I, I think Coco could sign some things, but the depth of stuff, like when Coco's message to the world and all this stuff, I thought just completely yes. <laughs> oh, but, uh, but the, me the had... message to the world is is a straight up fraud. It's 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 yeah. it's uh, they they just had Coco mimic a bunch of things and it used uh, uh, Clipo Vision to just cut out and and assemble uh, what looks like a thoughtful dialogue from a gorilla, you know, about like. It, it, and it comes across as like, I've read the IPCC reports and yeah. um, you humans are doing very foolish things. You need to stop hurting Mother Nature. Oh, really? You're very dumb. I don't even remember this. I yes. Mean, no, yeah. it's amazing. And it's it's frustrating because like I, I do believe that they have come some tasks for language because we've seen yeah. them do tasks. Chimps and gorillas do some tasks for this. I think the human language and structure might be our own thing, and there can be other things that have their own. And it's the frustrating thing when people say, "Oh, that's animals." It's like people are like, no, it's like its own thing, and that can be right. special. You know, a whale song doesn't have to be, you know, Shakespeare. It could be its own sort of thing that's alien to us, but has meaning and value. And so the the the, the weird that that we have to justify it our own terms is actually dangerous to me because then when it feels alien, so that that, that ends Coco up being kind of the uh, the final point of the video essay is that it's like the weirdest part is if we want to believe that animals have a language, why wouldn't we just try to learn their language? Why would we insist on dressing them as a human, separating them from all of their own species, and make them? pretend to be our species to, to feel good about that. And um, he makes a compelling case that uh, this, this boils down to animal cruelty. It's awful. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, if, 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 but but wa watch it and make your own decisions on it. Yeah, I would argue that we've done a lot to understand certain like behaviors of animals and stuff. And sometimes we want to think there's more, but a hug can just be a hug. Grooming can just be grooming, you know, and a warning call could be a warning call and stuff. There might be, there might be another layer of more sophistication to it but does it have to be, you know, a mother and her infant, 
you know, there's a lot of communication going on between there, but that the infant, there's not, they're not uh, uh, consciously aware of it, but there is. And so, yeah. Right. Well, and, and also it's like, there's a, as we learn more brain science, we learn that there are certain structures in the human mind that are absent in other species. And, uh, and if they were there in those other species, then uh, <laughs> the example I remember hearing is uh, teaching sign language to apes. If they had the capacity to translate abstract thought into linguistics, then they would do so by their own means. It, it's the equivalent of saying, I think all these birds can fly, just nobody's shown them how. So you walk up to a bird and you flap your arms and the bird's like, holy crap. Oh wait, I could fly this whole time. You know, it's like yeah. that's 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 the problem. Oh boy, people need to stop messing around with these animals. Hamsters, hamsters, gorillas. Cocos. What's next? Also, Coco had a thing for nipples in a big way. It was a mm -hmm. subheading on her Wikipedia page. Oh really? Nipples? <laughs> nipple fa nipple fixation. Wow. Two dot four. Uh, in fact, uh, the foundation got sued twice because. Uh, the, the, the trying to the, flick them nips. Yeah. She attacked it, right? Well, no, she she would uh, she would get very upset, oh, and, and 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 volunteers were told, "Hey, uh, Coco really wants to see your nips, so why don't you just <laughs> why don't you just take off your top and let her see your nipples?" What? And like, yeah. I don't want to do that. And you're like, "It's gonna go better for all of us if you just just whip them out, just <laughs> pull out those nipples." She's tired of seeing mine. Uh, she's got to see some young, nubile, new nipples. Yeah. I'm going to need you some to show guy, your nipples. Uh, yeah, uh, Coco needs to see your boobs and stuff and maybe a <laughs> selfie to just... Unbelievable. That sounds like a South Park it does. plot, doesn't it? But like, it, it's, uh, uh, it apparently... Our gorilla can talk. <laughs> our gorilla can talk, and he's what? talking to me right now. What's that? You want like, to see nipples? No, and then it's like, like, oh, my God, I'm a fresh young college student. I've come to see your talking gorilla. Oh, the gorilla loves nipples. <laughs> you need to show the gorilla your nipples right now. Watch, watch the whole video. It's, right. it's, it's very compelling. And they don't even show any nipples. Uh, uh, only, only, uh, uh, partially as funny as dressed up animal abuse is a new <laughs> podcast by the clever SNL alums, Dana Carvey and David Spade. Uh, it is called fly on the wall and they interview people that were either on SNL or hosted SNL or were like involved in their careers. Uh, there's a there's a a a, a kind of genre of podcasting that I would describe I I think kind of really with this title like a fly on the wall or an inside inner circle kind of thing where it's like this is not an interview interview where we're going through somebody's career or somebody's life it's not an overview it's not necessarily a news making interview but in the same way that you'd be interested to hear an hour long conversation with let's say the uh, uh, PayPal mafia, right? Like if, if just whatever they're talking about right now, that'd be fascinating. If you were to talk with the, the brain trust of the people that elected Barack Obama that have gone on to all these different things and just hear what they think about certain stuff. Uh, I, I think there is that genre of entertainment. And this is that for, if you are interested in Saturday night live, if you're interested in the names that they've had on so far, which include Chris Rock, Tina Fey, Rob Lowe. Uh, it is it is good. Dana Carvey and David Spade are not exactly the most dialed in interviewers on the planet, but <laughs> I think that they are earnest in that they are asking questions that they are fascinated by. It's a lot of inside comedy stuff, a lot of great inside uh, uh, SNL stuff. The Rob Lowe stuff has great stories of him doing both Wayne's world with Dana Carvey and a uh, Tommy boy or uh, uh, was it Tommy boy? Where did he do it? David Spade? No. Yeah. It's Tommy boy with David Spade and, and, and Wayne's world with, with Dana Carvey, mm. uh, including one that a uh, story that David Spade tells that, uh, uh, Chris Farley was ornery during the time that he was shooting Tommy boy with, uh, uh, with Spade because they could not miss any time on SNL. It was a very small cast that could not skip any weeks. So they were going in their off time to 
Toronto to shoot Tommy Boy. And one day, uh, Farley's super cranky. He's sick. And he's just like, don't talk to me. Don't talk to me. And he's sitting in his uh, chair on the flight up, putting a thing over his head, sleeping. He's like, I'm going to sleep. Don't bother me. So he does. He leaves. Rob Lowe, uh, you know, calls David Spade. And he's like, hey, man, you want to go get dinner? And he's like, yeah, sure. So they go to get dinner. Next morning, uh, Spade and Farley are in their makeup chairs, and Farley is just grilling David Spade through the mirror, just death staring David Spade. And he's just like, So, did you have a good night? Did you have a good night? He's like, Yeah, yeah. Hey, how's Rob? How's Rob? Did Rob have a good time? Do you have a good time with Rob? Uh, and he's like, yeah. And he just starts throwing his water bottles at David Spade. And he's like, why didn't you call me? He's like, you told me not to wake you up. He's like, I didn't know going out to dinner with Rob Lowe was on the table. You at least need to call. So great stories, little fun stories. If you you know certainly grew up to, to appreciate their work on SNL or in the movies, it is Good stuff, and and I would say the the best one so far was with Chris Rock. It was a very, you know, like comedians, comedian, like kind of high level chat about what's funny, the creative process. It was it was very good. Uh, I've got a pick. I uh, I, I watched a, a classic film over uh, the past week, uh, <laughs> um, and. Well, that one was was also great. I oh. uh, uh, had the pleasure of watching uh, my cousin Vinny last week. My cousin Vinny, which is on wow. HBO Max, but what a, what holds a, up is so great. What a what a what a trip through cinema history you've been on. Well, uh, I've seen my cousin Vinny before. Oh, I've seen. I've you seen said it. you oh, have. Yeah. Oh no, I've Jeez, no, I have seen it. It's oh no. Uh, I didn't great. want people to get confused with Back to the Future, but then I confused them all by making his. Sound like I was going to talk about that one, uh, but no, it's uh, a, a, another just fantastic uh, film. Um, a very easy watch. I just threw it on while I was working on the podcasts last week, um, and uh, kept kept getting distracted by it. It's it's really great, and it, it's uh, a, another kind of two hour movie that doesn't feel very long. Um, there's a lot of moments where you're like, oh, are we really going to go and do a whole thing? And they're like, no, we're not going to go do that whole thing. We're just going to get to the next that thing. Notable, it's like the last time Ralph Macchio was seen before popping up in Cobra Kai. <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. You know, My Cousin Vinny, too, such a great screenplay that you could really shoot as a, or you could, you could perform as a play, right? There's only like, like mm -hmm. you could, you could There's collapse only a couple of that, scenes. you could collapse that story yeah. into a couple locations, uh, uh, and it still would retain all the things that make it really fun and special, great performances. And you almost get the sense from some of the way that it's written that maybe they would have wanted this to be a franchise a little bit. It's some of it, but Oh, that I, they would they would want the, like him more to be kind adventures of, the, of Vinny, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh but uh man it holds Tell you what, it. reboot it. Put it on HBO Max. Like I'm I'm for it. That, mm. that I'm, now I'm into it. My I would, Uncle Vinny. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Pesci, Pesci probably wouldn't do it, but you could, I mean, like, I would say like, that's, that's a cool idea. Yeah. Marissa Tomei would be. Well, we will, Mr. Pesci would like to hear some offers, you know, let's <laughs> we'll, we'll tell us to get Yeah. Don't piss him off. Andrew, you got a pick? Uh, yeah. So I've got a couple picks. Um, one is, uh, Peacemaker, uh, loving it, enjoying it. Uh, everything's been great. Peacemaker is just Peacemaker been, rules. Yep. Yeah, it's. James Gunn, it is most James Gunn in the way that I want to see James Gunn do something. So I've really been liking that. And then the other is... Uh, uh, b b by the way, anybody who likes Peacemaker, if you haven't seen Super, watch Super. Super? Uh, yeah, James Gunn's kind of like when he was waiting for Hollywood to give him another big shot movie oh. he made. Yeah, I'd never... It, I'd it, never yeah, it, it, is, it is an interesting proto. I think Peacemaker is him at a different level of his career, both as a writer and, 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 and director, uh, taking some of these ideas and, and putting them on a whole nother level. But, uh, uh, yeah. There, I just looked this up. There is a novel series about my cousin Vinny. Oh, really? Really? Is that where it was adapted from or is that done afterward? No, no, it was just, um, there was just, yeah, there's been a couple books in the, my cousin Vinny, like universe. There was a, there was an attempt at doing a sequel, which fell through, but then, yeah. 
Uh, wow. In 2015, too. Oh, my goodness. A third book in 2020. Wow. There is also Bande Ye Bindas High. Like, what's that, Andrew? What's that, um, Andrew? An unreleased Hindi language comedy film that is a remake of My Cousin Vinny. Oh, nice. That they would... were served a legal notice by 20th Century Fox in <laughs> 2009, so it got shelved. I was going to say, that was a good idea, but it's yeah, not well, when you don't do it like that. Good at cleared says. Um, so uh, I am up. I think we're up to date uh, on Boba Fett. And well, we have, we have kept trying to talk about it, and you have said you are not caught up. So I went you for you up? guys. Okay. We were You're like, what are up. we going to watch? And I'm like, I need to watch Boba Fett. So yeah. they stopped yelling at me. Okay. Um, have you watched it man. with respect? <laughs> yeah. I have watched it with respect. And did you watch I, half of it in the past too? <laughs> yeah. I, I, that structure doesn't bother me. The, how he got to where he got to doesn't bother me. And the, the, I love John Favreau. I love John Favreau. John Favreau is amazing, and he's given yeah. us great Star Wars again, and I love that. You know what I also love is a really good writer's room. Helpful. It would be helpful. It, that you know, sometimes that makes all the difference in the multi worlds. I I feel like his what he's doing is really clear. I could not imagine doing it, but I feel like some of these stories. Like I'm enjoying it, but I feel like. It feels like a guy who's doing a bunch of things, writing a thing in a first draft. It goes out the door, and it's good. But had it be, I don't know, could be know, great. Bring in, bring in a couple other because there's things that could just hit a bit more, could be a bit more. They could build out that world a bit more. I think would be, and it's also like Mandalorian. It has that pacing where I'm like, you could fit twenty percent more story into the same time frame. It's got bones. It's got good, it's like, it's got characters that are interesting. It's got a place that's obviously very interesting. If anything, I think some of the meat that it really, really leaves on the bone is the fact that I don't think that Mos Espa has been the character that I think it, it, it truly could and should be in a world where, it, where you are talking about crime syndicates. They it's do a avert. street, mm -hmm. it's a street, the mayor's office in a casino. Yeah, it, it feels like it feels like an 80s TV show and that I don't feel like I'm getting a world there. And I'm like, and you have to think like make you can make Tatooine very interesting. Like, are there caverns on Tatooine? Is it underground? Is there other stuff there? Are there big bazaars with stuff? You know, I just felt like from the production design point of view, like I felt like it could be bigger, but just the story itself. But what, if, yeah. what if they used to have a worm? <laughs> All right. Uh, so. Some of the best science fiction, like that, I think is like you know Battlestar, where you know that you really knew that the Battlestar reboot was going to be something special when I think it was the the first episode out of the mini series was just about how they stayed ahead of the Cylons. It was something like very vital, uh, very mechanical, like, and I think that part of what's missing with this is that we don't kind of know what the data breaking bad was great about this with like the drug trade like uh the wire was was great about this it's just knowing like just that little bit of like okay what's the day to day like yes we we're facing a lot of the questions of like who's in line who's paying tribute who's not but i don't even know what this role that he's inhabiting really means like i don't like there's got to be a balance sheet He's he's running protection brackets. Like is he like, you know, is 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 this is he a crime lord? Is he kind of like a warlord where just all business goes through him and and he's kind of more of a stabilizing influence to a lawless city? Like there's just a, a lot there that that I I kind of feel like between that and and the smallness of the universe is just like it leaves me wanting more. I. I I want like uh, Matthew Barry's robot character to explain things to their the mod gang or the young mod gang. They you know like here's the way that it works. This yes. is why and this is why you have to have this. And you know I'm like oh okay cool I get it. Uh, and this is something that Brian um, and I have talked a lot about. I don't know quite why we need to defang everything that was brutal and violent about 
the Star Wars universe. And likewise, give a brutal, violent backstory to everything that was silly and cuddly uh, in the Star Wars universe. Well, in defense of this, that when he took out the swoop bike gang, went from Slave One, I don't yeah. know what they called the ship Slave One. That was cool. I'm like, that's cool. <laughs> like, well, that's yeah. ruthless. I think that's, but that's the thing though, is that it's like, it, it kind of swings between this this weird, like, I, I don't have a, 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 a beat on what kind of man Boba Fett is now four episodes into this. Like, because we do see this, this guy who is like, on one hand, very much seems to be this almost pacifist reformed uh, uh, man who has seen a different side of life post this traumatic experience. Uh, or is he the guy that just guns down a bunch of bikers with his spaceship? It's like, I, I don't, I don't quite know. I, and, and, and maybe we get more of it. Maybe it's more of a slow burn, but, but I, I, I don't, I, I think that, that there are, there are things that I would, I would like to know these characters a little bit more. And I Which, would, yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, do, are there going to be scenes like flashback when like, you know, he's on the Death Star and he turns to IG-88. Yeah. You know, I've been doing this online business management school and I have some ideas. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I want him to just spoon the rancor. <laughs> we may get that. I, I mean, we know we're, we, we've got Chekhov's rancor. We know where this is leading up to. Yeah. I also, I'm all for it. Yeah. I didn't, I don't know. This is like one of those things where it's like, they make him like, rancors are the most beautifully uh, amazing pets ever. Like, yes, they m brutally murder people like the only thing you knew of them, but what you didn't know is that <laughs> that guy that was screaming in pain because the Rancor died in the movie, he really had a deep relationship with this creature. He wasn't just a weird, deranged person that was really cool. You should look back on that memory and feel bad about the fact that you laughed at that guy screaming. Yeah. I'm enjoying it though. Here's I, Danny Trejo. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I, I'm glad that it's in my life. I I do like that. I, I like that flavor of Star Wars. Uh, I I enjoy Western Star Wars, man. I really don't like it. <laughs> I'm just having the worst time with it. It is every nightmare of a <laughs> of trying to watch a spinoff show for a franchise you don't follow <laughs> come true. So. Yeah, I had, you respectfully. know. Respectfully. Respectfully. <laughs> Falcon Winter Soldier was like that for me. And then um, there, gosh, and then what, and Loki just started driving me nuts. You know, that was a thing too. Where it was, oh, that was a cool premise. And then I'm like, this is just, I'm a bit more, a bit, bit more engaged into this. Mm. Cool. Moon Knight looks cool. Moon Knight looks cool. Yeah. Oscar Isaac, We're at wacky British accent. Where are we at on that accent? Boy, uh, I I still have not seen. Oh, the trailer. Tristan, my, I have to, I have to I watch don't, it. I don't know what is real. And I'm the Moon Knight, oh, the opposite of Sunday. <laughs> Son of a bitch, <laughs> taking my line. Cool, gentlemen. It's been weird. Ah, oh, great stuff. All right, everybody, we're going to take a minute, take a, take a short break, and come back for yep. some after things. Same. All right. Oh, okay. Here we go. Oh, I'm getting a call from Scam Likely, so I'm not going to answer that, but I will go find my lo-fi beats. Scam Likely, that's my cousin. <laughs> you don't have any names in common? No. Also, my surname is... It's is, is, is Likely. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome back to... Uh, the stream. So thank you again for, for joining us if you did on Sunday. Like I mentioned earlier, we will, uh, um, I'm pretty sure we were able to use a, a, use, an, a, use a setup that gave us a pretty clean recording. Um, and so I think what we'll do on Patreon, I guess I'll have to figure out which one should be like the official, but we can, we set up the recording such that we have, um, we have it without, or with, with almost none of the movie's audio. You hear some of it when we talk, um, and then one with just with with the whole movie audio, just like you heard it on the stream. Um, probably won't put the full video out because then that's just giving 
avoid the whole movie. But um, I don't know. We got to figure out. I got to figure out which which way it should be the official. Because I don't want to put. I don't know if I want to put two in the Patreon feed. I don't want to bug people too too much. But I don't know. We'll figure it out. But that's probably coming up a little later this week. And that was a fun time. Thank you to Skills Cat and Andrew Heaton and uh, Brian for joining me for that. We should do another one of those. Not, not not like immediately, but we should do that again pretty soon. And then we did talk about, we still have talked about doing uh, Dark Side of the Moon, um, which I would pro I'd probably do at home. I didn't, because we did it here at HQ, I didn't get particularly groovy. Um, but if I'm at home, it's very easy to just get, get wacko. I see you asks, how motivated are you to watch you? I would really like to watch the second the second part, the second movie. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I had such a good time doing that watch party that I think I think there is it would be very, it would be fun to to do that again. Um, and if we're able to make a way so that people can hear it after the fact and bring other folks in, um, then uh, then more power to us. Let's see. Uh, oh, I got a call from AT&T DirecTV. Interesting. Well, only I had an account there. Um, but uh, but yeah, and IC says the ending begs you to continue. I I agree. I agree. What's that? Uh, we're talking about Back to the Future and how we did our movie party yesterday and possibly doing another one for the second film because it went, oh. it went really well. Have you seen Money? How, how many times have you seen Back to the Future Part One? Just, Me? Yeah. Oh my God! I, I don't I don't know if I could if I could put a put a number on it uh, a lot. I mean, it was one of my favorite movies growing up. I, I remember seeing Back to the Future two in theaters, and it was the first time I can remember them doing a trailer for three at the end of the movie. Yeah, I we found out that they shot two and three at the same time, so they came out like months apart, like ridiculously fast apart which uh is really cool i kind of like i mean you don't see that much i guess fear street they kind of did that with with the the m new f m movie every week um, lord of the rings lord of the rings was yearly? yearly right oh wow yeah that's true that's true uh, that was that was uh, like uh, one year one year one year i remember they initially were talking about releasing the Matrix sequels within the same year. They were gonna put out mm. one of them in like spring and one of them in fall, but they would it would just be the Matrix would just dominate a year basically. Yeah. Yeah. Lucas wanted to do his trilogy, the prequels. He wanted to do them back to back, and obviously got away from them. And that people you often hear about them planning to do that sort of thing, and then it's good if you have a good story. And Back to Future two and three, they wrote this idea of this big story that starts here and wraps there. Matrix two and three were shot together yeah but i think the vfx work and just money wise or whatever they just decided to do elsewhere yeah um and i think so. it's safe to say a bit more scattershot story wise <laughs> it felt like a it felt like stretched out you know hmm. i and read it's a very tough proposition to do from the beginning right because you got to do the first movie before you, if you know if ever, anybody would even watch two and three, somebody circulated a old Rolling Stone feature article about. Uh, Here, I'll be right back in one minute. Then Larry Wachowski, now Lana Wachowski, but uh, about the interregnum between Matrix and Matrix Two. This was as Matrix Reloaded was about to be released in theaters. Uh-oh. Uh, and, uh, uh, about specifically, uh, you know, the dissolution of, of his marriage and, uh, his continuing, uh, interest in the, uh, uh, dungeon and sadomasochism culture. Uh, but it's fascinating that artifact in, in time. And also it, it kind of showed that like that was not somebody who was putting now her full attention into doing a sequel to one of the most beloved science fiction movies of all time. It's and it's there was a lot there was a you, lot going on. Yeah, you know, you can spend a lot of time on a project, sell it to the studio and get it done, and then they love it and they're like, Oh, we want it, we need to have this thing go into production now and yeah. you, we deliver release funding, mm -hmm. and you're like, Can I have a year? No. And it's like Okay, if you told me before 
when we were planning this that you would pay me for three scripts. It just, it's a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, look, I, I think, I think that the, the Wachowskis, they're at their best when they're at their silliest these days. You know, I like, I like the cloud atlases. I like, I like it when they're cloud atlasing. Uh, I still haven't seen the new matrix. Uh, but yeah, that, that back to the future, man. What was movies rule? Because people, some people hate too, right? I, I, I think that there is, you know, there, there, there are some arguments about structure or logic or something. But like, I love to. Like, two is the one I two watch more. Rules. more. Hoverboards, future stuff, all that. Well, and also, and, it's like it, it gives you the most of the ingredient that I think is the special sauce of the entire franchise, which is time travel right they go to the most places they intersect with the most things they are playing they're dangerously playing with this concept that rules the universe i was talking to rajni and we we watched quentin tarantino talk about how pulp fiction's like you know you'd see these bond villains or go beat somebody up and he's like i want to go follow those henchmen and see what their life is like and you get pulp fiction and that's you think great of, i said and i'm saying yeah apply that to back to the future where you're Biff Tannen, you have this really horrible family life, and this weird interdimensional dude pops out of nowhere and screws things up for you from time to time. And like, you know, like there's a version of that where he's the hero. Yeah. You know, where where he's just this, you know, uh because of just like how his life gets messed up by some magical power sort of time traveling stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, everybody ready to do after things? Yeah. Uh, do, do we have any outs? Do we need to be out of here in 30 minutes? Or, or I guess now. Um, one now. second. I got it. Let me just respond to those. Okay. Uh, I got sent a bunch of stuff from my high school and college years, and I had written a monologue uh, as a angry letter writer to Bob Gale and Robert Zemeckis uh, about the scene in Back to the Future 2 where uh, uh, a character is fired from his job and the, uh, the, the ownership of said company uh, because this very patriotic character that I had written uh, was very upset that uh, anybody would imagine a future where America was not... <laughs> in control of its own corporations. Hmm. Interesting. It was a pretty funny monologue. Yeah. Do you want to perform it? Are you able to I could find it. We could do it tomorrow. <laughs> uh, oh, by the way, uh, the game tomorrow. That's right. You mentioned that you, you told me that you have a game. Uh, I saved all of my movie stubs from my high school years. <gasps> oh. So we're going to play a game of what did Justin watch on whatever date, and we're going to name three movies oh. that were in theaters. <gasps> Or or we're we're released and then I will have the the literal receipts uh, oh, to show exactly what movie that I saw at that at that, that time. That is really good. Send me that doc. Or should I should I play along? Oh, I, yeah, oh yeah, you guys got to play along. You should okay. definitely yeah. play. Okay, I want to do that. Uh, all right, Andrew, how are you looking? <laughs> good. Great. Good. All right, then uh, you gonna do some after things? Yeah. Yes, please. And uh, we had said that they're that we're good on time. One thirty is my out. Okay, it's 30 minutes. All right, then let's get started in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm Intermean, joined by Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello, everybody. Justin Robert Young. Sir. Mr. Brian Brushwood. Yo ho! Gentlemen, we're now almost done with the first month of 2022. Oh, yep. Yeah. Who almost let it be February? Get it out. Get it all out. We're done with Let's this make... year. Was, Sucks. Was, was was that a fast month or a slow month? That was a fast month, I think. You think a fast count? I think it was fast. What do you guys think? I don't know. I so, feel like, I feel like I feel like it's about right. Yeah. Mostly mostly because there hasn't been a ton of travel. Like like that's usually what makes a month go fast is if there's like a lot of stuff that either I'm like looking forward to a thing and then time sort of zooms to that or there's a travel and things kind of just get sort of collapsed. So this this felt like also like uh, uh, this has been a, a, a crucial month 
in getting uh, World's Greatest Con season two like mm. ready to go. So I feel like that's been yeah. Get ready big... for the uh, for the hype engine to start cranking up on that. Cranking it. That's a, a phrasing. That's right. We're cranking. We're cranking here well, in Austin, Texas. Let's watch it. We keep <laughs> that... Austin. We keep Austin. A little, we do things a little differently. Keep in Texas, Austin so. crank. <laughs> Uh, uh, but yeah, no, I think it's been okay. What are our predictions for this year? Oh, <sighs> I don't, I don't know, man. I like, I feel like I'm trying to approach this year with, a, with freshness. This, if that makes like, as in Bel Air and do <laughs> and dopeness. In no, and I'm trying to flyness. I I want to give everything a new set of eyes. I want to feel like i can i'm seeing things for the first time or, you're getting you know, new eyes and a new perspective well i okay get my contact well on, obviously but. uh, uh <laughs> let's not totally run over bryce so he looks at this job with fresh eyes and doesn't <laughs> want to deal with us anymore uh <laughs> but I, so but, so I, I, do you feel like you have honored that through 24 days uh i think so i i think so um you know i've been uh, i've talked about this on other programs but i've been working on different parts of myself for the past couple of years and mm -hmm. um i don't, I don't know I've, i'm i'm ready to, to like, like, like mental, mental self-care kind yeah, of stuff yeah yeah to dealing with just you're not all you're not the you're, the cranium you're, stuff. you're not you're not modding <laughs> up like like a, like a like a boba fett employee i've got i've got a bump, i've got bumpy parts of my body but i won't tell you which ones oh, oh. somebody <laughs> talked to thundercat <laughs> Uh, so I think that's I don't like have a I like I, the only like concrete goal that I have is like I'd like to do three seasons of marbles this year okay up from two um, and other than that just try to I, I don't know find a way to enjoy life <laughs> <laughs> I, I almost said enjoy life again but I mean but it's not like I'm, I'm coming out of the gates of hell it's just you know we're, we're we're all in a new space and I think I don't know I'm Eyes Do you think open. part of it is coming out of mothballs past the pandemic? Like, yeah, like there was absolutely. there was a lot of like, ah, eh, what does it matter? It's the pandemic. I'm not gonna put a ton of effort or time into X, Y, or Z, like because there's a good amount. What of can that. you do? There, 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 there's a worldwide restrictor plate on everything. Yeah, a absolutely. Um, even even like little things. Like I was working out a lot last year, yeah. and I kind of stopped over the past few months just because. I had one little thing kind of interrupt the way that I did that. Um, and I don't know. That was Boy, a good Boy, is it easy to fall off. Man. It's, it is. So that's, Quick. I don't know. That's my perspective on 2022. I'll tell you what. I, I think this, I, I'm almost afraid to jinx it by saying it aloud, but I think 2022 is when um, collectively, culturally, there's a kind of a cultural gestalt moment of, all right. We're going to get back to work. Uh, we're going to get off the couch. We're going to go outside. We're going to go into rehab, and we're going to go back to the gym. Uh, uh, if, 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 there are, if there are publicly traded mental health uh, stocks, buy them now. Uh, if they, uh, reinvest in Gold's Gym. Uh, that's, that's what I predict for this year. Man, I'll tell you what. You, I, I, I would be gun shy on that only because uh, not because I don't agree, but because I feel like I've been burnt on that prediction since like March of 2020. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I, I would say prediction wise, I, I do think I do agree with you that, that there is going to be an understanding of where we are in our public health situation. Um, on a level that we have not seen up to this point. I don't know if people are going to want to go willingly or, or unwillingly through it. I'm now, now keep in mind, I'm not making a prediction about people showing up at the gym. I'm talking about people signing up at the sure. gym. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I, and, and I, I think if anything, what we are, what we're going to see is just a, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I I feel like I am I'm for real gun shy on any kind of COVID prediction because it is something that I've just been burnt on but what so a, many times. But what about personally, outside of the cultural My trend? Personal, of, personal. Yeah, what's what does the horizon look like for Mister Young? Oh Jesus, uh, busy year, man. Uh, uh, World's greatest con. Well, yeah, two's coming up. Two's coming out, and we're gonna start working on three. Woo. 
Uh, I want to do another silly project in between that. There's another project with a friend of ours that I don't want to talk about that uh, has been put off for a couple months that I want to really get working on. Uh, traveling, doing uh, uh, on-the-scene reporting politically. Oh, uh, mid are midterms this year? Midterms of this year. So that's That would be a lot of travel. And uh, so, yeah, there's at least two or three places that I want to go see people speak at. Uh, live shows for... Me, Heaton, and Briny together. That's in in the works. Uh, so a, a lot of stuff. I mean, this would be the most travel. This would be the most like a pre-COVID world um, that that we have that we have gone through. Um, mm. So I think that that's, you know, I don't know. I think in general, my biggest thing is just make stuff, be proud of it, release it. Like that's that's the only the thing that I think I built during the pandemic that now needs to be protected and, and cherished and uh, uh, just keep the engine humming. And, and really, I think I want it to be a really big year for dog and pony show audio, which is the production company. And that makes world's greatest con and, and everything else. And so like uh, that's something where I want to take that to the next level and make it bigger, make it better, make it something that people respect uh, whether they like want to or not want to jam this quality down the uh, the world's throat. I mean, I guess ears. It's a podcast. Yeah, I was you're not saying don't want to. Yeah, eat it. don't need you it. You could probably hear it if it was in your throat. And it was yeah, loud, exactly. So. I mean, when, when a podcast is good enough, I mean, it, it it's like it goes into your gullet. You absorb it. Yeah. You, you feel derive it in your sustenance chest. and calories. <laughs> what about you, Andrew? Do you have any? personal perspective on 2022 uh you know there's the trajectory i'm on right now which is i've got a book coming out in a couple month or two or whatever which already got a was had a start review from publishers weekly which is good i've got you know i did that i did that three book deal which is great so it means i know writing books uh i've continued to work at open ai which has been fun and doing some kind of cool stuff there and be able to you know i'm always excited when there's something i get to talk about because it's like you know, some of it's just stuff that has a long cycle of development before it's released. So excited about that. Um, the technology wise, I think, I don't know if it's going to be this year or next year, but I think that, um, I think augmented reality is, I think we're at the hardware point where we're going to probably very close to seeing really good, like AR put on glasses. And the ring, the reason I bring that up in this conversation is that I think we're ready for a new medium to play with. And I, I like VR as much as I like VR. If I want to kind of experience the VR, it means walking over to my headset and putting it on. And even though it's a quest, it's really easy. But I think that when you have a device that's like glasses that is easy to access as a tablet or a phone and you're in an environment, I think that could be very cool or it blends into your existing environment. And it may sound like, so what's the big deal? But it's like everything we work with around us is a display. And when you can start having three dimensional things and interact with them and stuff, the way we would do a podcast like this could be very different. You know, you might just sit in your living room and we would see all of our faces appear in front of us and feel like there's presence and stuff. Mm. The way that you would interact and do things, you know, when 3D, when virtual objects interact with the real world and you can pick things up and build stuff, you could sit down and build a web server, not by programming, but by picking up blocks and stuff and connecting stuff. Or if you wanted to build a game, you would sit down and put your game pieces onto a game into the game and watch them and say, move like this, move like this. And it would learn. And I'm excited about that opportunity of AR. Cause like I see the rate at which AI is, AI is accelerating. It is, it is moving much faster than everybody realizes. And that's going to have a spillover effect to a lot of things. And I think augmented reality and VR is going to be one of those places where you're going to get, you know, uh, Facebook just announced today that they've built what may be the largest supercomputer in the world or developing AI, and but they're also into metaverse and relating to that because they see, they put a lot of effort into like turning 2D photos into 3D images and finding ways of how do you create avatars and presence and stuff. And I see that accelerating a lot this year. This was the first year, this last year was the first year that funding into VR had matched the funding levels from like five years ago. And now you've got millions of people with, you know, Oculus Quest and other devices and stuff, so. Uh, I see. My my favorite implementations, and the and the reason I agree that that we're passing a an event horizon is the quiet implementation of a really really good AI 
uh, in iOS now, if you land on uh, the side home page or whatever, it'll oftentimes have a photo and I'll be surprised to find out it's a photo of, it's a really good photo of me and Bonnie. And I'll be like, when did I take that? And it's like, it's not one I took. It's like, saw this in a text message field. You never saved it. You never favorited it. Mm. This is clearly a really good photo because it has you and this person that I know that you care about in this exciting situation. Uh, so I'm just going to keep showing it to you until you recognize, oh, wait, yeah, no, heart that, favorite that, that should, that's good or whatever. Uh, the fact that that's already been happening, um, uh, you know, we, we've, we've talked before about how uh, I, I used to worry about sorting books, scrap or photos, scrapbook style, but, but I'm, I always imagined that in a far off time, AIs would be good enough to do that for me. They're already doing that, and they're even finding mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. where I'm not even looking. They're it's, like, it's, if you go and look in it, like they do face matching, like you would expect from like Facebook, um, but it's all on your device, so it's not going to to the cloud. The the right. image all, recognition when you search, you can search. Like I do this a lot. Like I search license plates, so I can remember my license plate, um, and then it finds it. Or like, uh, you know, show me fires or show me trees or whatever and it, it does a very good job of recognizing those things now. recently i mean uh, in uh, the natural language uh, man the the uh amazon device is very very good at uh I, I increasingly get more obtuse and more natural in the questions that i ask it and it just keeps delivering uh even on my phone i'll i'll, I'll ask siri uh, uh there's uh, there was a type of fence that I know I took a picture of while I was out in uh, uh, Tahoe, uh, Nevada, uh, some number of months ago. That's all I remember. And so I, I'll just say, hey, show me pictures that I took around this time in Tahoe. And then and then there'll be like seven of them. And I'll be like, one, two, three, four. Yep, there's that fence. This is the kind, kind of fence that I want. And wow. just that, that behavior, of course, is being noticed and logged and interpreted by the AI. It it's yeah, absolutely they've they've improved a lot of quietly what's going on there. Google Docs, if you use Google Docs, the suggested complete is becoming really really good. And I knew of startups that were trying to build stuff like that, and some that are trying to build like that. And kind of my advice to them had been just me as a person, but is like, uh, don't don't go into a space that Google's really good at and already trying to be good at and they have Ray Kurzweil inventing things for, figure out a different place, go into carve out a sector or stuff because I know people that wanted to do like stuff like autocomplete and Google Doc. I'm like, Google's working on that. Yeah. And 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 not to say that you couldn't make a better thing, but it's going to be very hard to compete with resources because when you talk about a company like them or other large companies, when they start pushing out stuff that are AI based, they will spend billions of dollars of stuff and spend many dollars per user to make an experience that's good because they're making a long-term bet and they can outspend smaller companies on that because a small company might be like, oh, it costs us eight bucks per person to have this feature. And it's like, yeah, Apple doesn't worry about that. You know, that's baked into the price of, you know, when they sold, you know, a hundred million iPhones and stuff and yeah. all that. Yeah. But there's a lot of opportunity out there still. Yeah. And like little ways, there are still little everyday ways for that stuff to make its way in. Like, talking about the phone example brian like when i get into my car my car has bluetooth built in so my phone knows when i'm attached to my when i get in my car and so it it'll pop up and it'll say hey you're probably going to work you should take this way or hey you're probably going to get lunch you should probably take this way it'll take you this long and, uh, and uh, other weird crossover things where it's like uh hey couldn't help but notice that you have a doctor's appointment uh on this other unrelated app yeah. uh it's coming up at this time traffic is a little bit tough why don't you get started now um and that's not even like um like an activation it's not like i see that alert and i open up my map and i go oh give me directions i know where to go but it's giving me the information of hey you should take this route because traffic's busy on this other route that you normally take. Uh, and I, that's, that is a really interesting experience because that is not in an app. That is just the delivery of information. And, and that's the subtle implementation in our personal devices. Um, uh, a more ostentatious example is uh, uh, for my birthday, we talked about the fact that I got uh, uh, this DJI, DJI FPV uh, drone 
which does really good job of, of hand holding. I'm still flying it in baby mode, but uh, eventually I'll be able to unlock it and uh, get so good that you, you can go 90 miles an hour and all that stuff. But DJI has such a holistic approach to it that it knows all the local laws, all the no fly zones. And like, like uh, I'm out there flying around and it says, heads up, air, aircraft is approaching. And I'm like, how does it know? And then I pause and I can literally, as if on cue, uh, I can literally hear an airplane flying directly overhead oh, wow. that, that it's just keeping up with. And, and uh, uh, it does gentle corrections. For example, when I'm flying too close to branches, it doesn't, you know, shout at me, uh, do klaxons and stop. Mm. Instead, it just, it just, you know, it's a little bit like I'm going through tar. It slows it down naturally for me mm. as, as I go forward. It's, um, uh, it's really astonishing stuff. It's, I, I like the increasing invisibility of AI from a personal convenience factor. I could be talked, I, I, I could be poked into ruminating on, on the uh, security aspects of all that. But uh, in general, uh, it just seems like life is getting easier and easier and there's less and less of the BS to worry about. Apparently it uses, it picks up the transponder signals from the airplanes. Oh, that's amazing. Wow. So it's not, it's not even centralized. It's just straight up it's local. scanning the local. Wow, wow, that's crazy. That's awesome. Yeah, ADSB technology. That's amazing. And that's, yeah, they are, I have a friend that sells those and he's just a big fan of that company and how it. And they, they just, they took an early advantage poured a ton of money into it, diversified quickly into into commercial and those other areas, and not just things that were going to be, you know, consumer stuff and you know make things you can sell to police stations, things like this, because your markup's way higher and just incredible. I think um, that, that's that's so huge with stuff like that to just differentiate your pro product from your 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 amateur product. Like it's just yeah, God, it's it's such a boner when you're like, I'm really into this. It's forty thousand dollars because we sell it to the government, and you're like, "Well, that sucks." I'd have three thousand for you. Yeah. Well, and it's the Adobe pro uh, uh, prob problem, or yeah, maybe paradox, paradox of like, you know, it uh, especially the way it used to be. It was very expensive software, and they didn't care if you pirated it because if you learned on their software, then you would go buy their software when you had money, which it, I, which is exactly how I've done it. That's how I got into music making with Ableton. That's how I got into Photoshop. That's how I got into Premiere. That's and that's how uh, HBO for a brief while like refused to make it possible by any legal method. There was to, no to, HBO to, now. To, yeah, exactly. Uh, and so they would enjoy all the notoriety of being the most pirated content on the Pirate Bay knowing that all of it was free advertising for to get people into Game of Thrones. Yeah. I remember watching I for some reason I had downloaded an early copy of the season 3 premiere of Weeds. I was really into Weeds on Showtime and uh the episode finished up and it got to the credits and it said season 3 episode 1 credits. <laughs> it wasn't it, it was uh, oh, an, an advanced it was version. An, yeah. yeah. It, the, that was, it, had been leaked. The story was that uh, the CEO of Showtime did it on his kid's computer or his neighbor's kid's computer and uploaded those files to draw up like attention. Oh, that's amazing. Hmm. Um, and so like, yeah, it, it's not all just direct money making, especially when you have a lot of money in the bank. Crazy thing, too, is Adobe's as big of a company as Disney. Mm -hmm. wow. Adobe is a 200 quarter billion quarter market cap. They've you know, just, when, that's how you know when you uh, do a cable authentication, I believe that is Adobe technology. Yeah. Uh, like they just have that whole network. The they, bridge. Yeah, like, yeah. I I'm going to go on a little one more sort of tangent about AI. And that is that uh, working in communications like I see like see tons of coverage for stuff. And there is a fear which can be understandable because like it is an unknown technology. The whole reason like open AI exists is because of what could happen if we develop really advanced AI that doesn't work in our best interests. But there's also sometimes, I don't know how to describe it, but like I see, I would intentional ignorance or something. Cause like I'll read something where they will go like, Oh, well this can't do this. Da, da, da. And I'm like, that's not the way you do it. You could have done this differently and got a better outcome, but it's like you were afraid to see that it could do this thing. And then you look at like Hacker News, which is a lot of tech people who talk about stuff. When we put out, you know, the Codex model, which was able to generate code, like you put it in your VS code, your code editor, and it adds code. We worked on this with, you know, GitHub, and we built the model, the engine for doing that. And, you know, now 
over like thirty percent of all the code for major languages is contributed from Codex. Um, but when that came out, you'd people like, I'm not going to need it. Maybe it's for amateurs or whatever. But then you watch really high level people figure out how they can be much faster and use this. But there's this fear, there's this reaction, and 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 it's fine to be skeptical or to wonder if it's really going to be beneficial or whatever. But I see that where people go, oh, it can't really do this or it can't do that, and I'm watching stuff happen on my screen that it's doing the things that people can't say that you know said that they can't do, and I can prove it and demonstrate it and stuff. But people just really adamant, yeah, because it, it's scary. Is it, you know, we want to think the thing that makes us special is, you know, Kirk being able to outsmart you know Nomad by like divine, you know, you know what's the negative of this or whatever, and it's like. You know what's going to make us special is our relevancy to other humans. What makes us special is that knowing an idea of you know knowing people and stuff. But these things are moving fast, really fast. And mm -hmm. if you either, I would you know not. I would say that if anybody has any interest or whatever, the more you can learn about it, the better. Because um, it's just these things are already. We we talked about. We we're still getting over. Oh, algorithms determine the things I watch, and the algorithms that run TikTok and YouTube are very basic. They are yeah. very, very basic. You know, even Facebook, for uh, several years, people thought Facebook had really advanced ad tech. They didn't. They just had such huge volumes of page views, they could be inefficient at it and still make revenue, and then they've tried to get better at it. We're going to see smarter algorithms and smarter stuff and, and ideas like, oh, well, we should have a thing where they should know, I should be able to know what my data is. It's going to get to a point where we won't need to know your data. It'll watch, you know, the last three websites you went to, and it'll understand enough to, you know, predict you or know to, you. Or, or so. to, and, and, and again, we all want to believe that we're, in, you know, supremely individualistic. And the truth is, uh, demographically, tell me what country you were born in. Tell me your age. Tell me your ethnicity. Let me watch three pages that you've gone to recently. And and I know exactly what advertisers to pair you with. I mean, yep. uh, and, and that's not it's not voodoo and it's not. They're new. listening to my microphone, though. But it's like <laughs> they're listening to my microphone. Like wow. uh, for I just I said before that I like tennis. And the next thing you know, I got a tennis ad. I got it right uh, after uh, watching my tennis videos. So, so you're you're the type of person who likes tennis and talks about tennis, and you got a tennis ad. How did they know? Uh, they were listening on my microphone. Uh, and, but, and a part of that is because for so so much data is like dumb data. Like a lot of the reasons that you're like, dumb. A lot of the reasons like YouTube, or if you think about like iTunes, iTunes has to have an AI to recommend hey similar music like this. And that's not because that's not necessarily because of hard data. That is like metadata right. of. People who buy people this who like buy this these. Tend to like these, and right. you do a, you have enough of that big data that you can just see the pass. You can see the uh, what are they called when walking past wish pass or uh, um, where people cut corners and they build a path and uh, instead of using the way that they paved it. Yeah, um, but that, it's and, a lot and, of that. And there following have been the like uh, college campuses where they flat out didn't put any sidewalks and they just waited until the dirt paths emerged. Yeah, and well, then they're like, that's where the sidewalks there's go. The paths exactly. Um, and so as data gets smarter, as we get a better idea of like, 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 think about this, like, it's only been in the past couple of years where YouTube kind of knows what's in your video. Like, you don't tell it a lot about what is in your video when you upload something. But now with machine, machine image recognition and transcription, now they can know more about what's in your video and you don't tell it uh, anything. You can't tell it. You can't tell it um, a lot of what is in your video. And th there's also some amount of backtracking that almost becomes like a curation experiment. Experiment, uh, Like, a, uh, for example, uh, if you are a Stephen King fan, I would venture to say that uh, people who have read a lot of Stephen King and then embark upon the Dark Tower journey and see all the crossovers get, in general, more excited about the Dark Tower. So if you're an algorithm, you might recommend books that you know will eventually tie into the dark tower mm -hmm. and hold off before you eventually say you uh you might want to try the dark dark tower now you know similar to uh you know watching like part of your frustration with the star wars uh boba fett stuff is, is I, because you've been on a different path mm. i want to address somebody said here i said i don't understand the fear when you work the AI. you clearly see how much more work is needed i would say that you're you may not be in a position where you're seeing what jobs are being replaced right now when they are and particularly if you look at technology jobs in developing countries transcription was a big thing transcription doing transcription from having people listen to stuff and transcribe it 
AI transcriptions gotten to the point where it's really good. Used to be people, you'd, if you had to get a bunch of images and you wanted to remove the backgrounds, you'd actually pay people to do that. You can download that code from GitHub and run it on your computer right now. You don't even use one of these AI services you pay that does that. Uh, summarization, article generation, there's a lot of copywriting stuff that was outsourced to other places that is no longer being outsourced there. So there is an impact right now. It, so, it is, uh, I, and and, and uh, 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 I totally agree that you probably don't see the impact if, if for you live, for example, in the United States, you probably don't know a single person whose job was lost to an AI bot. But meanwhile, uh, 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 the, the emerging middle class of the globe uh, uh, is being squeezed out of, of certain jobs. And that's, that's one of the things that I look for. How can we make AI more empowering? How can we help people at that, those information jobs find other ways to make use of their skills and whatnot? Because there's an incredible amount of talent around the world. And um, you don't want people to just to be pushed to the sidelines. You want to, how can we make these tools accessible, et cetera? Yeah. So, gentlemen, picks? Uh, sh uh, short pick. Uh, uh, I watched the Dora the Explorer movie, the, the Lost City of Gold. Oh. It was great. It was, it was really great. it was adorable that's the one where she's like it's an adult playing her right <laughs> yes 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 uh it, it's got huh. strong uh new jumanji vibes if you enjoyed the new jumanji movies then uh uh it's it's great um don't want to spoil much but uh so self-aware so much fun uh i loved it it was a lot of fun i can't wait to find out if it's a map uh is it a map is it a map Okay, is it a map? Uh, is it a map? Let me just say that they bump into a poppy field and a very amusing sequence follows. Oh, okay. <laughs> where they see the world very differently oh. from the live action that they had been experiencing. Interesting. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll also share a quick pick. We, we did a movie party stream over the weekend with this, but I watched Back to the Future for the first time yesterday, and uh, I was very, very surprised at how much of that movie I had not picked up via cultural osmosis what what was the biggest surprise um i i think uh <laughs> do you know what it really was what the the dance the the school dance because the under the sea dance the enchantment under the sea dance <laughs> because i've seen i've seen all of the other shows that do a, a take on this mm -hmm. um and so i guess in my head it's so a family guy did it and in and the song that uh the Brian plays is uh, uh, never going to give you up. Gotcha. And for whatever reason in my head, it was like, what, what song could they, is actually it going to be that they play? Yeah. Um, and so that was a lot of fun, little like weird, like, Oh, that's actually how it fits in. That's what it is. Uh, yeah. It was also fun to see genuine surprise when at the end of uh, 30 minutes of exposition, Doc Brown gets shot by the Libyans. Yes. Uh, Bryce goes, Whoa. He just straight up got killed. He just got How murked. Not, they murked. What? <laughs> <laughs> and like for for it's a, the Libyans. <laughs> a very specific call out to the Libyans. But like you know, for for a relatively early mainstream time travel movie, does a very good job of avoiding a lot of the things that we make time travel movies about now of paradoxes and time loops and like it. It doesn't even need to. It's not even in that space and it's really smart for that so uh back to the future we i had to watch it on a dvd uh it's it, it's not streaming very many places you can buy it but yeah. yeah uh did you get the 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 trilogy set it is the trilogy set you should also watch the uh, i think on that set they have the video of back to the future the ride the now oh. defunct ride at universal studios uh Ooh. but check that's, it out. that's fun when, 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 once you watch everything it's uh it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a good time. It says 10 hours of bonus footage. So I'm pretty sure that's on there. Cause that, that was one of the big DVD set, like the last big DVD sets that, that, that came out that were like, that was like, Oh, here's a great cleaned up version blessed by all the right people. Mm -hmm. uh, a trilogy set. Nice. Uh, uh, so God, that movie's so good. Just, it, was just, it was great. It was great. It's great. Uh, uh, do you have a quick one? Yeah. Or any righteous gemstones. It's so good, isn't it? Daddy thinks he's a sex man. <laughs> uh, or some kind of sex man. It's just, there's, all right, there's a thing that this show does. It's done it twice where you are kind of constantly going back and forth with the humanity of these characters. And sometimes they remind you of yourself. 
Sometimes they're you're embarrassed to think about how much they remind you of yourself. Sometimes they remind you of assholes. Sometimes they remind you of broken people. But every once in a while, with Judy Gemstone, <laughs> you just peel back the wallpaper, and she, in an almost unbroken monologue, explains how she sees the world with such confidence and it is horrifying profoundly (laughs) profoundly (laughs) effed up like just something that is so screwed up that you're like what wait what are you talking like that's criminal or like really bizarre like and she says it with such confidence Edie patterson is one of the greatest comedians of her era on television she is in like just such a groove that like they just set him up. She knocks him down. And last night had one of those scenes that is just amazing. Uh, amazing. Like in, in the three way tournament for all star, terrible person. She definitely crushed it then and earned a victory, but it's not even ter- like it's yes. She's being terrible. And then she admits why her motivations for being terrible. And you're like, I don't know what to do with it. Like as a, as a viewer, I'm like, do I feel sorry for you? Like, do I think that this is like, I, I you're just befuddled because she says it with such clarity and such confidence. It's great. Mm. There we go. Uh, awesome. Well, that'll do it for after things here. Andrews had to, had to bolt out, but uh, thank you for joining us here on another week of programs. It's been after. Woo. After, after. Alrighty. Thank you, everybody, for joining us here for Weird Things and After Things. We'll be back in about two and a half hours with Cord Killers. You're uh, telling me your brothers don't want to bang you? <laughs> oh, that's right! Oh, no! Oh, it's a, I was like, what was he talking about? Oh, no. It's the line was, you're telling me you don't want to bang your hot brother? <laughs> <laughs> Already. So good. All right. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. We'll see you later. <laughs>